This story began with the fact that our hero suddenly passed the game that he played for three years for him. It was too easy, and that he wanted to play one that will last at least for the summer 10. That infinite game. And for him it sounded fun, but first he had to adjust the difficulty and thought that for him the minimum difficulty would be too hellish a mode. And as soon as the game started to run, the monitor began to glow. Bright color, and that day, one man on earth became less. And it had been exactly five years since his rebirth in this world. And the old world was just a subheading of time. And now he couldn't believe he was a child. And the fact that he was born into a bankrupt family, and that he would never get another job and never leave the village, everyone told him so. But he didn't like that aura at all. To his mom and asked her if she needed help, but she just said she could handle it and he could go play. And in telling his son, whose name was Alan, our hero realized that he was forced into this child's body. And that he couldn't tell anyone about his rebirth because he didn't want to worry his family. But suddenly, he found his spell book. And after reading the contents, he realized that this book is a summoner book, and with it, he can create insects, a class that allows you to use magic to create cards with summoned monsters. But still, he felt that he still couldn't fight the monsters of this world, and only wanted to become strong enough to fight them, and all he could get was a blessing from the summoned creatures. And now he has 20 cards outside of spells, their blessing increases his stats which makes its strength comparable to that of an adult human being. And the fact that he can raise his stats and that means he can control the game and even though he believed it himself, but he couldn't swing it properly yet. But that's when Catherine came running in and started waving at him saying she wanted to play knights with him. But she accidentally stepped on the beetle her brother had summoned. And as soon as she came closer, our hero said hello to Catherine. And they, without any thought, immediately went to play. But our hero realized that his sister is his sparring partner and she also wants to hunt monsters. Raising her wooden sword, she began to shout that her name was Catherine, and she was challenging her opponent to a fight, but her opponent was our hero, whose name was Alan, and he shouted back that he accepted her challenge. But in fact, our hero realized that for him it is a huge shame because he is actually now 35 years old. But this is not just a game, and he cannot relax because his sister at full speed is already rushing to him to strike the first blow. But he realized that she ran up to him too quickly. And with many blows, our hero with great difficulty began to parry all the lunges. Continuing to parry her attacks, he realized that after the strength and speed had increased, his body wasn't used to this yet. And strike a few more times, his sister broke his wooden sword, and he was full of frustration, because it was the tenth marvel she had broken. But her sister kept smiling as she realized that fighting with her comrade was much more fun than fighting with her father. And as soon as the battle was over, our hero started telling her not to tell Uncle Geld about it, but his sister didn't understand why she had to do that, and Alan reminded her that he's been training for five years, but compared to her, he's still nothing. But suddenly, their father intervened in the conversation and began to tell Alan not to be so discouraged because he is his son, and she is, after all, a swordmaster, and that her destiny is to serve the nobility. But Alan thought for a long time how strange it is, and realized when this five-year-old girl passed the evaluation ceremony. But Catherine also couldn't understand that she's a regular swordsman and what a swordsman is, it's just an ordinary talent. And with a wave of her hand, she began to say that there was something written in Alan's talents too, and it was something special. Their mother, who was also standing nearby, started asking her husband if it was true, but he said it was, but none of them could read, and the priest said Alan didn't have any talents. But still our hero realized that it doesn't matter if someone can read or not because he's got some kind of abracadabra in his talents. And the god of this world must have pressed the wrong keys. And because of that, he won't be able to reveal to anyone that he is the master of summoning for a long time to come. But his family realized that even if he had no talent, he was still their son, and they were proud of him, and he shouldn't worry because he would grow up strong and smart. Alan realized that although this family is so poor that they don't even have a bathtub, still he's glad he was reborn with them, and wants the fact that they're both his parents, and although younger than him, he's still very lucky. And once their uncle came to visit, he said the knights were coming today to assess Catherine's abilities. And going inside the village, she and her father passed near the church, and people who paid attention to them could not understand whether this girl is a swordmaster and is not the daughter of a laborer, because between the laborers and the rest of the villagers lined up, although they are all simple people, all. But suddenly, some guy showed up and started telling our hero that he didn't come just to watch. As soon as Alan saw him, he realized it was the freckle-faced boy from the ceremony who's pointing his index finger at him right now and saying that there's no room for those without talent. And Catherine ran up to them and stood in front of Alan saying he was very strong. But the freckle-faced guy kept saying he wasn't. He's a farmhand, and his kids will be farmhands. And just when Catherine wanted to kick his ass, her uncle ran up and started restraining her. 
and their father took the hero aside and asked if he was okay. Alan replied that of course it's okay because he's not offended by the child's words, and at that moment, the village chief appeared and began to say that the knights are already here and everyone should disperse. And as soon as the main gate of the village opened inside, knights on horseback began to come in. Catherine and all the other kids looked at them with excitement. They were very cool and they were led by the commander himself. And as soon as he approached Catherine, he asked if she was the swordmaster, and she said she was. At the main commander of the knights suddenly began to say that lying from the talent is a crime and punishable by death, and to test now will be held duel. But her uncle could not understand why he says so, because they have already checked it. But the commander-in-chief continued to say that if she refuses, he and her daughter will be executed. But our hero with his father, hearing this, could not understand what he says, because I'm crazy. And while her father was angry, Catherine took the sword and started telling her father it's okay, she'll do it. And raised his sword, she began to say that her name was Catherine, and she was ready to fight with honor. Her opponent, whose name was Knight Referent, replied that he was ready to fight. And while the other knights kept her father under close watch, Catherine snapped out of her seat and began to attack her opponent, and continued to strike many blows. Other people looked at this child with amazement because she was able to swing such a huge sword with great ease. On our hero realized that she had been training for this since she was three years old, and he would never be able to do this even if he didn't choose hell mode. But at that moment, the commander-in-chief of the knights kicked Catherine with all his might, causing her to fly off into the nearest wall. And crashing into it, she made a huge dent in it with her body. And seeing this, our hero and Catherine's father began to worry about her health. And as soon as they wanted to run up to her to help her, the knights who were standing near them began to roll them to the ground. Alan lying on the ground realized that he couldn't handle the soldiers, but he didn't know what to do now that Catherine's family might be killed. He looked up and saw that Catherine was starting to get back on her feet, but her aura had changed and that she simply activated her Mario skill, and her opponent noticed that this is her special skill, and no sooner had he raised his weapon than he saw that the girl jumped into the air and began to fly at full speed straight at him. With a swing of her sword, she made a very strong attack that made her opponent barely stand on his feet. But realizing that this is not enough, she began to continue to attack the commander-in-chief with all her might. Her father and the knights were in great shock, because they had not seen that she could fight like this before and swung his sword a few more times, another knight began to shout that the battle was over. But Catherine couldn't understand why it was over since she had just begun. After that smile, she started to thank her opponent grandfather because she realized that he was very strong. And as soon as the commander-in-chief decided to get to his feet, he failed and fell back to the ground saying he wasn't a grandfather at all. After all, he's only 24 years old. But everyone who watched the battle couldn't believe that she defeated the knight and that she really is a master swordsman and their village finally had a master swordsman. As soon as her father was released, he ran up to her and started examining her, and our hero, who was looking at her, realized that she didn't even get a scratch, and that she was so strong, and no wonder every time they trained she left him with bruises. The other fry lifting the sword, the girl saw that the sword was completely bent, and he decided that without any doubt the password would be happy to know about it. But as soon as Catherine ran up to him, she started asking if she was a knight now, but the man said she had to wait until she was 12 before she could join the Academy for Gifted Geniuses. But after hearing this, Alan was convinced that there was an Academy in this world. But at that moment, another freckled boy came up and asked if he could show himself too because he was an axe maker. But the man told him that he didn't mind and would send an instructor for the entrance exam so they should practice hard. Well, our hero who was watching from the side saw that the freckle-faced guy is a one-star axe maker. The commander-in-chief is a two-star spear carrier and Catherine is a three-star swordsman. The captain has fewer stars than she does, and Catherine is the strongest here. And the number of stars on a straight line affects the characteristics. And he's probably the only one in the world who has hell of a difficulty here, and all his efforts are increased by 100 times compared to normal mode. And even though there's no zero within the increase, zero is still zero. If the three stars have that kind of power, how far off the mark is he? and when he started to open his status, he saw that he was still at level one after five years. But this did not upset him at all, because he realized that his life was just beginning, and he would be able to get his eight summoner stars. And after the triumphant performance of the Swordmaster, their village became known as Catherine's Village. And as soon as the fall came now, our hero was already six years old, but he was still on the first level. And with 2,000 repetitions started when he was three years old, he had developed his throwing skill to the third level. 
but the hell mode would require at least five more years, and deciding that for today he was done with training. He's back at his house and sitting by the fire his mother is late tonight and it's kind of weird. After all, in winter and fall, his father becomes the chief in the hunting party of the butler has to earn by any means possible. But coming out of the house our hero saw a lot of people carrying his father on a stretcher, and as soon as they approached him they saw that he was badly wounded. But her brother began to tell her to calm down, because he was wounded too early. But she began to weep loudly because she did not understand where she could find money for medicine, and her brother replied that they were lucky to find a marais flower in the forest, and the knights gave them money for it. But Alan began to think that his father could have defeated a huge boar over three meters tall, and every year he fought dozens of them. But still he couldn't understand how he got such a severe injury, and started to ask his uncle what had happened there. His uncle, however, replied that by decree of the elder, this year the freeholders were able to take part in the hunt, and they found it an easy task. But the most important point was panicking his father was protecting them. And as she continued to sob, our hero's mother suddenly began to notice that her husband was beginning to come to his senses. And once he was completely gone, she finally rejoiced. When Alan saw this, he realized that he was the oldest. But he had this strange feeling that there was an invisible wall separating his family. Geld started to tell him to get some rest because he'll take care of everything and his unborn child too. But Alan started to tell his uncle that it's okay because he'll take care of things. After all, he's decided that no one dares to hurt his family and it's time for him to stop acting like a child. The next day our hero started doing important things. And as soon as his uncle noticed that he was carrying water, he realized that last night he wasn't kidding. As he continued to work, our hero realized that the sharecroppers give 60% of the landowner's harvest, and in order for the family to survive the winter, he had to harvest as much as possible. And two days later, he still had a lot of crops, and realizing that I just had to have enough, he decided that the next thing to do was to get meat. But before that, he went out into the field, and as soon as he had mowed a lot of wheat and finished with it, he finally has enough experience for the new skill card enhancement, and the fact that he's improving creatures, and he even got a few new creatures and rejoiced that it was a really good day because he was able to much, much be for his collection. But at that moment, a look of surprise appeared on his face as he looked in the book and saw the call of a beyond, and it was a rank six amphibian. If he can use the skill, with his provocation, everything will go smoothly and he can catch up to 50 birds, and that should be enough for the winter. And once he started using the amphibian sitting in ambush, he couldn't understand why no birds were flying and could they not hear very well. But at that moment, a huge bird appeared, and looking at it, our hero could not believe his own eyes. Where did it come from a huge bird? But still it was familiar to him because it was an Albahathian M I which his father gave him means soaring like a bird in the sky, and it was because of Albaheron that it appeared. And as soon as he grabbed the amphibian, Alan realized that it is huge, not less than 2M in height on such certainly he did not count on such a course, but such a chance falls not often. After all, it is his first hunt for demodenic beast. And throwing a rock straight at him, he managed to hit him in the head, and realizing that it's great because he has a cool skill at throwing objects. But not thinking long after that, he drew his sword and started attacking the bird. But after a few strikes, he realized that he was still not strong enough to kill it with one blow, but he had a backup plan. And taking out his book, he began to summon his warhounds. And ordering them to attack the bird and start destroying it, they briefly thought about ten and started pouncing on the huge bird and biting it from all sides. But seeing that these dogs are still so lacking, he realized that the bird is not so simple and not for nothing. She is still D rank and realizes the fact that is he still weak. A little hesitation, he wanted to strike himself with a sword. But the bird was faster, and with the help of its huge paws, it pinned our hero to the ground because of which he realized that because of such injuries, he can and die. And I understand the fact that he can't hold it in anymore. But it didn't take him long to realize there's still a way out. After all, he still had blood-sucking insects in reserve. And all of them with great speed started moving towards the huge bird, and as soon as they got close to him, started attacking his neck. And as soon as the huge bird loosened its grip, our hero realized that this was his chance. And just as he thought the bloodsucker was the best in the situation, and the fact that he used 10 hours and 3 boos and bonus stats went down, but the important thing is that he wore it out and got a chance to win. And as soon as he got the chance, he jumped up and delivered a critical blow to the bird, because of which he finally saw that he got 100 experience points and jumping for joy with his draft dogs, he started shouting that he finally succeeded, and he won and killed a huge monster with his hands. And now he's feeling even better than he thought he would. A little later, Catherine and our hero's mother and father were in great shock at what they had just seen. That our hero began to tie up a huge bird that he had killed with his own hands. And as soon as the uncle approached him, he began to say that he had passed his words to the headman. And that if he keeps destroying the Albacarons, 
He'll get the rest of the stuff besides wings and bile to purify the magic stones. But a little earlier he began to realize that if the provocation works on demonic beasts as well, then he can kill Albacarons every three days if there are two of them, then he will definitely die. But what was even more amazing was that he noticed that his experience points had reached a thousand and that he was finally able to raise his level to second and that his stats had not gone up very much after this battle. Raising his marvelous book, he couldn't be happy that he had finally leveled up and it had taken him six whole years to do it, and it had been a long time, but he understood what else to expect from the hellish regime, and that the stats for strength and magic had increased a lot compared to the first level, and he knew they would increase, but not that much, and it had been a month since his father had recovered, and he realized it was time. When he got home, he started to go inside and tell his father that there was something he wanted to discuss with him, and after making the whole point that he came up with, his parents still agreed with his decision. After all, he hid from them for a long time. But when he was one year old, Elin said that he will be given a lot of difficulties that will not be overcome by hundreds of people. So he knows a lot. But still, he thought that if he said what he planned to say, will their parents not fall into panic? But his parents couldn't believe what he was saying because it can't be that Elina is the lord of the world. But as soon as his father stroked his head, he started saying that from birth, he was different from them not only by the color of his hair, and that he was an amazing child, and he didn't believe in the result of the ceremony, and he trusts him completely. But Alan went on to say that he didn't want to hide it, but suddenly father said that his first trial was over and our hero couldn't understand how he knew. His father went on to say that he has a lot of challenges to overcome, and no matter how hard it is, he must remember that he has a family to support him. But his father also decided to ask if Geld knew about it, but Alan couldn't understand why he was asking, and his father went on to say that he was always bragging about his daughter, and that he could finally get even. And as soon as December came our hero together with Geld set out on the road after all, they went to get supplies for the winter. Our hero realized that he could not hunt albacarons, and that he should exchange meat for firewood and salt, and after a long time our hero decided to ask his uncle. Only he must not tell his parents about it. How a sharecropper can become a free commoner. But his uncle said he had to pay ten coins, and then the feudal lord would sign the freehold. At least that's what he was told. And after hearing the hero think that if you count a child in his family of five people, you need 50 coins. And before he left the village, he decided that he would make money and buy his family out. And after a little time in the city, our hero realized that soon his adventures would only begin. And after a few days at the market, he found out that he had to kill 500 aljua hares for 10 coins and that it would take him a few years and he wanted to buy an iron bar weapon that would be enough to kill two alkirons. But he still had to save money for food and other things. But while our hero was looking at the weapon, there was a guy with freckles asking what he forgot in front of his father's store, but Alan could not understand if the leader of the brats, and that means that he is after all the son of a gunsmith. And getting closer to our hero, the guy starts asking why he's looking at them like that. Does he want to run away? But if he survives a couple of blows, maybe he'll let him go. Alan still didn't understand why that jerk was at it again, because he'd always hated pointless battles and games that didn't give experience. And drawing his sword, he turned around and started telling that boy to stop talking because he would deal with anyone who got in his way. And as soon as he started attacking our hero with parried several attacks, realized that he is not even close to Catherine and her three stars. But once he had him on the ground and had left his sword on him, the hero asked if he still wanted to go on. But the guy lying on the ground, all he could answer was that he'd finish him off next time. Nine months later, Catherine was picking up the baby and saying she was so cute and had a baby sister too. But in the meantime, our hero kept fighting that freckle-faced guy. But Catherine started telling her little sister if she wanted to play knights. But near the battle continued, and Alan began to tell Drogo to pull himself together because his movements were too easy to read. But he kept replying that he knew, but there was nothing he could do about it. But suddenly when he heard a sound, he turned around and saw Catherine training with his sister. And lately he realized that he had been training Drago for a very long time, and during this time, his little sister had been training herself for three years, and he couldn't wait to check on her after two years. And as soon as midnight came, our hero's father entered the house along with his uncle Geldoy. His father started to say that they were called by the headmen, and they had increased their duty from ten o'clock to fifteen boars, and now they would have to kill five more of them. And also, this year, there will be more wolfmen involved in the hunt like last time and what they wanted to object to. But it's the Lord's orders, and they can't say anything to him now. And the worst part was that next year it could go up to 20. There's no way to undo it. After hearing this, Alan thought about the fact that he doesn't know the details, but it seems that the Lord wants to destroy more monsters, and this problem is because they can't obey him. 
and turning around he began to tell his parents and uncle that the lady had shared her knowledge with him, and they should rely on him because he would figure something out. And as soon as October came our hero together with his father and uncle came to the main gate where other hunters were waiting for them. And once they got together, our hero realized they were happy with their leader, and his father was fully recovered. But at that moment his father turned around and started telling him not to get too close during the battle and he was only going with them to watch it. But there was another guy who started to tell our hero's father that if he gets into trouble, he doesn't need to risk his life to save his life. But the same guy put his hand on his shoulder and told him not to think about it and just focus on the battle. As soon as the preparations were finished, they all began to move out. But our hero realized the fact that now the duty has increased, which means more men are needed. And as for the newcomers, he'll be personally supervising them. In the family of a sharecropper for seven years, and never been so far away from the village before. For as soon as the gates opened, he saw the vast glade and that it was not the first time the knights had walked this path. His father said it's all right, but they have to go the other way now. A little while later, they reached a place where there were a lot of monsters. It was the very hunting grounds of the big boars. And while everyone else gathered together, our hero watched the trees and realized that the boars leave their places in the fall, and that from the name it is clear that on the top lives a white dragon, and one day he will be his prey. And suddenly his thoughts were interrupted by a scream that someone was coming, and as soon as he turned around he saw a huge fucking boar, and that it was very huge but the hunters were prepared for this turn. And as soon as they were able to surround him, they started using their weapons to do a lot of damage to him. Alan watched the situation and saw that they were able to stop it, and the fact that they first lure him and then immobilize him, and then they have to hit him in the weak points, and this tactic was created, and years on it all used for more than ten years, even without talent. And as soon as he saw the moment began to say on points that now it's their turn, because last year, by order of old age, ordinary free, just people began to participate in the hunt. But they have no experience and strength, and it attracted to a bunch of problems, and as a result, his father was badly wounded. And that it was a mistake to send them to the front lines again, they'd better hide and wait for the right moment. And once they had completely surrounded the boar, our hero called his insect Denk and ordered him to act. And as soon as his insects flew and hit the neck of the boar, he fell to the ground and our hero began to shout to his father that it was simply unbelievable. The young hunters who stood behind began to look at their hands and wondered if it was their strength increasing, for this was a test of the gods, and they were very grateful to him for it. Our hero realized that everything happened as he thought they got a lot of experience, and if they continue in the same spirit, they will soon be able to stand in the vanguard. And now that they have participated in a real battle, they must quickly deal with 15 boars. But looking at their experience, our hero was surprised. After all, he also gained 400 experience points for killing the boar. And his experience points reached 2,000. He was able to rise to level 3. And from now on until he collects the 50th moment, he needs to hunt boars and huge birds to raise the level. His life will change a lot if he gets high. And after 5 months, our hero began to notice that everything was going very well. He reached his fourth level, and he pumped magic every day, and after a year and nine months he was finally able to reach what he dreamed of. And after checking his status window, he saw that he now had access to rank E animals, but he couldn't quite figure out how to properly use his inventory. After all, today he has increased his level, and there are two good changes in the inventory can store an unlimited number of items that will fit in an area of 30 square meters is the skill inventory and to strengthen the animal's E-rank, he needs magic stones that are contained in the bodies of monsters, and to create an insect rank, E, he needs more magic stones. The ones he saw must be rank E, and though they are small, useless, and of low rank once he hunted them, but he didn't understand, where are the stones? After all, rank E stones are almost worthless, and in the forest you can collect a bunch of them, and collecting stones is such a hassle. Thank God he has inventory. And three months later, he could now summon creatures of rank E, and having sorted out his stats, he realized that this is what the system is like, how summoning should work, and now he can use all the advantages and such a clever system invented by the creator of the game, and now he sees the essence of his class. And the fact that insects poison animals, do damage birds, get information, and scouting plants heal rocks protect, and each has a role in the battle, and that is the power of the one who calls upon, and that in our hero's eyes flash the future a whole army of creatures capable of crushing any stronghold, and it will be commanded by him. But still he did not understand if this is his future. For in the fall begins, and this year the Lord gave orders to catch twenty boars, and somehow in a disgruntled voice he told our hero not to dare to throw anything away this time. After all, this is the year the Lord will visit their village for the first time, and that he's only here to see the boar hunters. 
but he's got a lot of knights and men with him. But as soon as he came to old age, the village began to thank him for the meeting to which the headman replied something they should be grateful for his visit. But the Lord began to apologize because he is sorry that the quota is so high because it is the king's order and therefore he cannot refuse. But the village chief couldn't believe his ears that this was an order from the king himself. But our hero standing behind couldn't understand because more and more amazing things were happening in this place. And as soon as the Lord noticed our hero, he began to ask the old man if this is his child. The old man replied that this is the son of the hunter Rodin, and he will accompany them on the hunt. But the Lord's daughter suddenly said that he was the child of a laborer, and these words did not please the Lord, for he began to say that they were still his people, and that he should not hear such things again. Bowing his daughter began to say that he was sorry, but as soon as she turned her head at our heroes, he realized that such a stare does not bode well. Our hero, to show them the way and his wars will help fulfill King Alan's decree, immediately became clear to him. And he began to explain that the quota of twenty boars the residents of the village could fulfill if they worked together, as his father had said. But the Lord was surprised at these words, especially because Rodin had said so. But suddenly the doors in the village began to open and say that the hunters had returned. And when he looked at it, the Lord was very surprised because they had killed three boars in one hunt and the fact that they were armored. But Alan began to explain that the armor was made from boar hides issued by the Lord last year. And on top of that, they trained over twenty hunters in a year. He thought it was a good start on another man who was standing near the town said that it was all fine and that they were able to kill three boars in one day and that there were only seventeen left. But our hero interrupted him and said that there were only ten boars left. Hearing this, the Lord was puzzled because they had only started half a month ago. But Alan began to say that they had enough men to kill more boars on each hunt and that this year they'll do the duty themselves. And after giving it some thought, Lord replied that he had no reason to worry. On our hero was puzzled whether he should say it, but gathering his thoughts he called the Lord and lowered his head and began to ask if they could keep the boar skins for the next hunts, for that was his father's request. After a short thought he replied that of course they could, but the Lord's subordinate suddenly intervened in the conversation and started asking the Lord if they could trust the child and if they should check them out, but the Lord replied that there was no need for a mess child and no reason to take it. Alan was pleased that the Lord understood. And the next day in the house of the village headman gathered three men. Alan, his father, and his uncle Lord, who was taking them to his chair, began to say that the land reclamation decree had been dragging on for fifteen years, and some villages had failed but not Karina. And turning to the hunter Rodin and Geld, the Lord began to speak, that they had hunted for over ten years and worked for the good of the village, and therefore he was going to reward them. And from now on, they and their families become free commoners, and they must continue to fulfill their duties. They couldn't even imagine such news. And as soon as they looked at each other, they immediately began to lower their heads in gratitude to the Lord. But our hero was so happy that he couldn't even hide his action, because he had been thinking of such a reward ever since he learned that the boar hunt was conducted by order of the Lord. He earned only five gold pieces and was depressed, but now he is free and can leave the village and hunt wherever he likes. And the first one he will hunt is the dragon. But the Lord suddenly went on to say that the rest of the laborers who have worked for more than ten years will also be rewarded and pay taxes as commoners or remain serfs. Let them choose this morning. Why did they start the monster hunt with Rango asked him because he can't wait to learn about it. Well, our hero didn't know it himself because his father never told him. But suddenly his uncle raised his hand and began to tell him that thirteen years ago they began to develop this land. But in the fall they were attacked by a multitude of boars because they had destroyed their food supply. And then Rodin exclaimed that they would kill if they ate one boar. And once they started hunting they were happy to kill even one, but they lost many too. And he always told him not to blame himself for it. And after hearing that story and that it was such a story, and that he believed their words. And that as lord of these lands he is obligated on the citizens, and in the past he has been very, and now he must ask for anything. While pondering the reward, not thinking long, father found a hero, began to say that if they let his son work in their house, unlike him, he is very smart, and he is sure that he will be useful to them. But these words did not please our hero as much as the Lord our hero could not fully understand these words. And Alan started telling his father not to ask for it, but his father still insisted that they could use him as an errand boy. And without thinking long, the Lord looked at his subordinates, none of whom replied that he didn't mind for there was no doubt that he was clever. But Hero could not understand how to refuse because his dream of leaving on monsters is slipping away if he will work in the house of the Lord. Then everything will only become more complicated, and now he must think how to get out of such a situation. 
but the Lord suddenly said that he did not think that he would be an errand boy. And being Rodan's child makes him an official servant of the House of Granville. Well, for some reason, Alan's father was even more shocked than Alan himself, but our hero didn't understand. And what's the difference between an errand boy and a servant? Because it's not what he thinks it is, and he needs a reason to refuse, and he needs to think fast before it gets worse. But when he looked at his father, he saw that he had begun to weep, and as soon as he realized the whole point, he began to lower his head and say, because it's impossible for him now, and he can't refuse, and so leave the village within a few days. And when her sister heard about it, she began to weep loudly, but his companion Catherine, with sadness on her face, asked, is he really leaving? To which he replied that she should take care of herself, but lastly, he wants to play knights again. And the whole family was now watching their battle and just saying that he didn't get dirty, and even though it's a farewell game, who's to say it'll be good for them? And as soon as they bared their swords, Catherine began to say that she was ready for battle, to which our hero replied that he was a servant of the Baron of Granville, also ready for battle. But as soon as Catherine moved from her seat, Alan began to move faster and used his speed to harass her movement and attacks. After all, he decided that today he will definitely win because with his skills of speed and intelligence, he will be able to defeat her. And swinging his sword for the last time, he put the box in their battle for she had lost, but not all of us thought so. The hero said it was no one's. And holding out his hand, he said they weren't done yet and they could fight again. And Catherine shook his hand and said that next time she would win for sure. But still, our hero noticed that she moved differently than in the battle with the deputy commander of the knights and that she will soon go to the academy and then serve in the royal family and there is little chance to meet her. And although he spent almost all his magic stones for this fight, but he is very happy to see her smile at the end of it. Finally, his mother began to hug him but he realized that he should not cry because the older brother cannot do that in front of the younger brother and turned around and began to tell his younger brother that he should become stronger and protect the trees. On leaving the village, he met his old comrade who gave him his hand and gave him a knife from his family's store. After saying goodbye to everyone, our hero began to leave, although his father took one last look at his son and said that he was a good boy. And before he started to get into the carriage, he asked his father if his life would change when he got into the carriage, but his father leaned over and said lastly that his future would not end as a servant and he should seize the opportunity. And as soon as he got into the carriage, they started to leave. And lastly, he decided to look at his village and promised himself that he wouldn't do his best, although he didn't realize until the end what this new life would be. So he left the village and started a new life in Baron Gronville's house. The very next day, the Baron's daughter sat on Alan's shoulders and shouted at him that she couldn't reach and he must straighten up, for he is her servant, you must obey. But he held her feet, and thought he might accidentally drop her, for he had left the village and come to the baron's house to be the servant of some petty girl. But as soon as she tasted the fruit she got, she didn't like it because it was too sour. And then she started giving orders for Alan to run to the market and find her a papaya, so she'd forget the taste, and day after day he fulfilled the whims of an eight-year-old girl, and that he probably wouldn't get a chance to hunt after all. Suddenly the hero looked up and saw that an airship was flying over his head, and that it looked like a whole city. But the Count's daughter started to tell him that he was stupid because it was a magical transport, and he was seeing it for the first time. And that her brother's coming back from the academy in the fall, but now he has to get up, they're going to the market. But as soon as the day was over, he returned to the attic of the mansion he lived in, and the next morning he started using his skill to smell some flowers to replenish his mana reserves for five, six hours. And a little later with his amplification of synthesizing and creating, he realized that this room wasn't an internet cafe, but since no one else lived here but him, he could swing the skills as much as he liked. And having taken his breakfast, he started to approach the table where another guy was sitting. And as soon as he called him, our hero started to sit down at his table, and the man started to ask him if he was satisfied with his service in Lady Cecil. But Alan realized that in the house he was called a servant, not counting the numerous servants and those who work here recently are not considered servants. And a little later he began to enter Lady Cecil's room, for he has two duties he takes care of the Count's daughter and serves the table. And the meal of service is simple enough, it is bread vegetables and soup to the Baron's new family. It is the same, and though they try to appear modest, Lady Granville who came into the room began to say that Alan seems to be used to the work already, to which he replied that he had a lot of help, because you can't even say he was a laborer, said the lady. But the count, who was sitting next to him, told his wife that he had no talent. But our hero couldn't understand how he knew. But he's not surprised because it's the feudal lord's duty to know everything. But suddenly his daughter paid attention to it and started smiling strangely after she found out that he had no talent. And jumping up from her seat, she began to say that she was a sorceress, 
and her older brother Michael the Swordsman hearing this Alan was surprised because the sorceress has two stars, but suddenly the Count began to shout at his daughter not to reveal the secret so carelessly. And a little angry, the Count started to get up from the table and tell Thomas what about him. But Thomas says with tears in his eyes that he's sorry he has no talent, but he wants to go to the academy like his brother or sister. But after hearing all this, Alan realized that talent was more common among low-ranking commoners and serfs, and that two out of three children with talent were rare in the nobility, and had concerns he didn't know he had. His mother started saying he had nothing to apologize for, and his father backed him up. But he'll be admitted to the House of Lords and he knows that's where he meets wonderful people with no talent, and that's where he and his father met at the ball. But as soon as the kids heard the word that there was a score, his older daughter immediately shouted that she wanted to go to the prom too. But her older brother replied that she would be in academia and no score for her. That's when Alan realized that when she's 12, she'll be at the academy with Catherine and Drago and they're not going to get along. A little later in his free time, our hero gathered information in the city because there were no restrictions for servants, and he only had to return before the next morning, and that the market is located in the area of the Northern Gate, and it is about two hours on foot from the Central Square, or four hours if you go from the Southern Gate, and that their village is no match for this place, because there's even an adventurer's guild here. And in this world, such places are called adventurer's guilds, so Rascal said. Adventurers kill monsters for a living, and if that's the case, he can do it too and get experience for money. Well, as soon as he got to the front desk, the girl started saying that he's only eight years old and you can only be adventurous after 12 o'clock and she's sorry, but he should come when he grows up. But he's forgotten that he's still young and that he wants to do some more hearing work at his father's request, but he can't stop hunting. And walking over to the bulletin board, he saw a lot of different monsters. His book, he started to turn on the autoplay and even though there was no information about the monster locations. But at that moment, some adventurer stood behind our hero and began to ask what the child forgot here, because this is not a sandbox. But Alan was not confused and began to ask if he did not know where to find these monsters. But the adventurer, this made him even more angry, and he started to answer why he asked him that, and then hearing the answer that if he answered, the boy would go away. And not with much kindness, the man began to answer. That usually their habitat is hard to get to, so they don't write. But the closer he got to the White Dragon Mountain, the stronger the monster. After thinking about it, Alan realized that White Dragon Mountain is where the great boars live. But the man went on to say that he'd never been there, but he'd heard that it takes seven days to get there and it's not very close. And after hearing him out, Alan decided to ask him if he knew what roads led there, but the man got even angrier and said, is he really mocking him? And looking again at the bulletin board, the hero saw some strange monster for which they gave 200 gold coins and that they wrote where it can be found. And remembering all this, he realized that his father named Masha after him, and that for adventurers like him it is too much, and he should leave it to the knights. But our hero still insisted on his own, and continued to ask what about the white dragon. The man replied that he hoped the knights would kill him because no one knows his exact location, so it is impossible to go to the mountain. And that even this trek, a thousand coins will not buy the danger, and one man will not want to fight a white dragon even for such a reward. And at that moment, two girls appeared and started shouting to the man standing near our hero what he is doing there. After all, they were just about to celebrate, and why is he standing near a child with very sparse black hair? But when he heard the man's name, our hero thanked him and turned around and started to leave, because he had learned everything he wanted, and now he knew what he could do. As soon as it was November on the 11th, Alan ran down the road and realized that this season would be cold and likely to snow soon and ran to the north gate. Guard began to ask if he had a pass but he showed the crest of the Lord. And seeing it, the knight began to ask if he was from the house of his grace. But our hero looked at the crest and realized that it was much more useful than expected and that he had long since prepared for it. And once outside the gate, he rejoiced that he was finally free. And that's what my father saw when he left and came back to the village. He's got a whole day to hunt and now he's going to have a blast. And as soon as he ran out, the knight who stood near the gate began to shout, do you really need no guards and where are you going alone? but our hero did not even want to listen to him not to lose the fight for a while. And the fact that he will be unpleasant to meet high-ranked monsters, because now the goal for him is D-monsters, and if they are equal to Albaharan, he will not lose. And the fact that he has already run 10 kilometers, which means it's a good time to use your summoned animal hawk. And he called him to him, and started to give him orders to walk in a circle. And as soon as he fulfilled them, he started to praise him, because he became smarter after the improvement, and now understands the commands. 
and now he's going to release them all to use the skill and find the monsters. After all, they are now very far from the city but somehow strange because no monster he did not meet and about an hour waiting for the appearance of Albakaran well, perhaps the chance to meet a monster is small. But still, he had to prepare for battle, and he began to take out the blade that Drago had given him from his inventory, and it was just in time, for his summoned eagle had returned. And he started to show where the monster was, even though he didn't know his rank so, he decided to be careful about shining the light exactly where it was, but he needed to find out where it was, but still he couldn't understand why he couldn't find anyone. And as soon as he stepped out from behind the bushes, he saw a huge horde of goblins, and there were about ten of them, and the fact that they were about a meter and a half tall. As soon as five of them noticed our hero, they began to run at him, but Alan began to call his tigers at once, and he summoned as many of them as there were goblins. But as soon as the goblins saw who they should fight with suddenly hesitated, because it seems that they are definitely afraid of his summoned tigers, but it was too late, and our hero began to give orders to those to destroy the goblins, and what was most beautiful was that our hero within a radius of up to 50 meters could summon monsters, and now he would simply block their escape routes. And as soon as the tigers surrounded the goblins, our hero's first fight in this new place began. Goblins standing still suddenly moved and began to run towards our hero, but Alan did not hesitate and began to give orders for the tigers to act. And in the midst of the battle, Alan saw that in his notification window appeared that he had defeated one of the goblins and received his 200 experience points. And then he cheered you because he realized that he could defeat them with the help of his summoned tigers. But suddenly, one of the goblins simply one blow destroyed the tiger, and opening his book, the hero decided that he will not be given. So just win, he needs to quickly finish with them. And summoning her insect butterfly, she started to fly up and distract one of the goblins. As soon as she sprayed her pollen to put Stan on them, which put them to sleep, Alan took advantage of the moment to pull out his stone cannon and throw it at the sleeping goblin. But after the blow, he realized he couldn't kill him like Albuquer. Even though he's the same rank, he can still order his tiger to finish him off while he's unconscious. And after a few minutes, he still destroyed the rest of the goblins and got his 200 experience. And it's only been two hours and he's already gained 1.000 experience goblins on the hunt. You prioritize always at him efficiency. And so far goblins are the most valuable in terms of experience. And as he approached one of the goblins, he realized he had the body of a human. He took out his blade and began to take out crystals. Even though it was disgusting on the magic stones are the basis for the summoning. And he must collect them and that the goblins are just for this purpose. And at this moment, the hawk reported that there are five more goblins in a radius of three kilometers. And the fact that he has already killed almost 80 goblins and five horned rabbits and got his 16.050 experience two levels at a time, and for him, it turns out to be a very productive weekend. And now he knows how the skill of his summoned butterfly works, because there is a chance to put the enemy to sleep, not 180%, and each summoned butterfly can use it on multiple targets. And to make the additive work on higher ranked monsters, he needs to use multiple summoned creatures, and that he should collect rankest stones to summon butterflies, and noticing that it would soon be night on the fats, began ordering his hawk to look for other targets. But they still stayed in the same place, and our hero couldn't understand what was wrong, and why they were standing in the same place because he himself was awake and full. But then he realized that they all couldn't see in the dark anymore. And the fact that the summoned monster has chicken blindness, and that he doesn't know which way the city is, and now he has to cut his weekend short. A month later, our hero once every six days, that is, four times already went hunting, and was able to raise his level to twelfth and when used to want to hunt more often, but he still has not bought weapons and armor and want to earn money and buy and improve equipment, and you are so simple. But the only problem was that as a high servant, he only gets 50 coins once a month. And so word started telling Alan that he was doing a good job, and that he was getting reports from this butler, and they were extremely flattering. And today he again tried to leave the mansion before sunrise, and he is now wondering what he does on weekends during the last month. But our hero realized that as expected he is a suspicion, and it is better for him not to lie now, because it will only be worse, and not thinking long he answered the Lord that he was hunting monsters. But Lord couldn't understand why on monsters and our hero answered that he is the son of a hunter-killer of boars, and he lives hunting like his father. Everything sounded natural, and our hero realized that he should not suspect anything, but the hero wondered whether his rebirth next to his father was accidental or not, but Lord replied that he understands that he is the son of the hero after all. A butler friend intervened in the conversation, and started asking what he was doing with the horned rabbits, but Alan realized that they thought he was killing monsters, 
The butler went on to say that if he was selling the meat, he'd better stop, or there would be bad rumors, and instead the Lord's family would buy them back for one silver coin apiece. He thanked them for their generosity, because they had helped him out with money and time, and now he wouldn't have to go to the butcher, and that now the meat that was garbage could be converted into money. Six days later, and on his day off, our hero was eating devil fruit, and sitting near a tree, he realized that first he had to kill one hundred goblins, and five rabbits would be enough. But that's when his hawk flew in with a report that he'd found the goblins. But now the hawk was behaving strangely, and he asked our hero very strongly to hurry up because of what he did not understand. Why so fast? Because he gave him the command to hunt only within a radius of three kilometers. Continuing to run through the forest, he started to hear someone screaming, and on the way he saw a dead goblin and realized that there was a battle. He saw two girls, one fighting goblins and the other looking after a wounded comrade, and that they were now trapped in a trap. As he looked closer, he realized they were adventurers he'd met in the guild. Without thinking, he began summoning the other three custom-made orbs from the gun store. Taking out the first ball, he started throwing it with all his might towards Goblin. The girl who was standing near him was surprised to see that Goblin simply flew aside. And as soon as our hero jumped out from behind the bushes, he started telling the girl that he would help give in turn could not understand where he came from here. And with his iron ball, he began to throw them at the goblins who could not defend themselves against such power. And as soon as the iron balls ran out, he realized that he didn't even kill them all with the steel balls. But now he didn't want to use the prizes in front of the other guys, and decided that he could handle his own strength. And Knight run to one of the goblins, he started telling the girl to fight with the handless, he'll take care of the other one. Well, as soon as Viroy ran up to the goblin, he realized that before he had avoided personal combat with them. But now things are different, and he is finally stronger and will be able to defeat them. After a few minutes, the girl drove up to her comrade who was bleeding and began to tell him that they were saved, but still he was breathing very hard, and she realized that she had not passed the test of the Lord, and now they need to hurry up and heal him with the healing skill. But the other girl replied that she had no mana left. And with tears in her eyes, the girl continued to shout that he did not die. But at this time behind her back already appeared our hero, who began to slowly walk towards them. And as the girls got closer, they noticed him and started asking if he was the one who killed all the goblins. But the hero looked at the man and realized that he has a terrible wound, and he will definitely not reach the city, and that he has medicinal herbs, and he will now try to heal him. But the girls were shocked by such an offer, and were willing to pay him as much as he would save him. And taking the herb of life from his inventory, he knew from the name that it was medicinal, but he didn't know how it worked and now he decided to check it out. And as soon as he applied the healing properties of the herb, the guy started to slowly come to his senses, and literally in a moment, his early healing was over in a moment. And as soon as he rose, fully began to ask his companions, did they cure him? But replied that it was a boy in turn. Our hero replied that he was glad that the herbs had worked, and he touched the girl. He said he was going to touch her hand. But as soon as the pain went away, the girl started asking what it was. The hero replied that it was a Miraza flower. He had two of them, and he remembered his father, who had been cured by these injuries and quickly. The Miraza flower is a plant that restores the maximum from the physical state, and the herb of life is a plant that heals them. But at that moment the man rose fully, and as soon as he looked at our hero realized that he was that child from the guild, and asked what talent he had because he was very strong but the heroes replied that he had no talent. The girl could not believe these words because he had saved them, and now he should let them thank him, but it was enough for him that they would not tell anyone he now wants to continue hunting. The man replied that he did not worry about it. Well, maybe they can help him at least something. And after thinking about it, our hero replied that he collects magic stones, and that about all the goblin magic stones and 100 E rank stones, and as soon as they paid him for his help, they started to go on their way. But the heroes asked if the three of them could get to the city to which the man replied that he had already met an armored ant. So from the goblin, certainly will not die. And as soon as they left, our hero started pulling out his magic book and checking before he started hunting. And calling his bird, he began to ask him why he had ignored him since he had told him not to go near people. Did he really want to help them, or did he feel sorry for them? And maybe he also knows feeling and compassion, and that the summoned monster should obey him because he's basically just a set of skills and characteristics but he ignored the order and acted on his own will. So it's not an unknown creature, but it does have a mind. And stroked his bird, he said he didn't blame him, but he would think what commands to give him if he next found people in need of help, and now he was counting on him. Hearing this, his called bird rejoiced and spread his wings. And it's been a few days since he's met Rain's company, and now he knows that a summoned creature can have an opinion of its own. And he also managed to get 100 magic stones from this group of strange adventurers.
and from now on, he knows how to progress on his path of summoner, and the hunt can be quite rewarding. And as soon as December began, there was snow outside, and our hero who was clearing it saw the gentleman and began to greet him. As soon as the Lord noticed our hero, he said that you now he looks better after two months, but the hero noticed that the commander of the knights sometimes come with a report to the baron, and the knight's duty is to protect his liege, catch robbers and destroy monsters. And this is not an army to fight other armies, it seems in this country don't know what war is at all. And as soon as they sat down to supper, the Lord asked, Is it really the meat of those horny rabbits that Alan caught his daughter had already answered that he caught five rabbits in one day, as expected from the son of Rodin, said Lord, and that he had heard that the village of Cyrenaica had fulfilled the order and obtained twenty borovs? Well, one of the Lord's daughters began to say that if they caught so many, why didn't they send them anything? Because he remembers that last winter they ate boar meat and our hero thought it was strange too, because that number of boars really should have given tons of meat. And is it really that he was sent straight to the capital to the king in that huge balloon? But the Lord at that moment began to tell his child not to dare to be naughty at the table, and that children are really hard work to bring up. But Thomas sitting at the table began to ask our hero, could he get a white stag for their table next time? But his sister started telling her brother that before he gave orders with her word, he should first ask her permission. But as soon as Thomas leaned over to his sister, he whispered in her ear that they would have a tale for New Year's Eve. And after hearing all this, our hero answered, or rather he had to answer that it would be done. Their mother began to ask Thomas not to bother Alan so much, but still Alan realized that the white stag is a monster of rank C, just like the great boar and his father's team used to hunt them, and it's time for him to try. And the next day our hero took up the hunt, and as soon as he had summoned his amphibious toads, the white reindeer did not keep him waiting and appeared very quickly, but as soon as he approached them he was immediately trapped and fell into a huge pit. And standing over the pit, our hero said that he could not be called a summoner unless he used the abilities of summoned creatures. And as soon as the white stag began to climb out of the hole, our hero drew his sword and finished him off. And then he saw on the notification window that the white stag was killed 2.500 experience points Allen, after all he spent the whole day on it, and he was given only 2.500, and he realized that it would be better if he destroyed the goblins because 100 goblins, it is already 20.000 experience and now he hopes that at least he will thank them. And after a while, the people who were in the castle started shouting that the monster was coming towards them. The Lord noticed this and started telling them to raise their weapons, because they should hold out until the knights arrive. And as soon as the huge white stag appeared in the main square, all the others saw that Alan was near it and began to climb out from under the stag and say that by order of young Mr. Thomas, he had got the white stag. But Lord couldn't believe his own eyes because he couldn't even imagine that he had managed to get a white stag after all. And the guys immediately rejoiced because they realized that they will have a New Year's feast and that they will not hit dirt in the face. The Lord's wife came to our hero and began to tell him that he was a loyal servant. But the Lord could not believe his eyes and began to ask the butler. And really that this child has no talent because he single-handedly killed a monster of rank C and that they should now check his entire family tree. But Alan was still very happy because thanks to his achievement that day, the Baron's family had no shortage of meat, and he will now be able to go hunting all day long, and his tasks include hunting monsters to get food and also help people in distress. And he was even rewarded with 100 pieces of silver, and of course he expected more, but I guess the Baron is having money troubles, and that it was great that he could hunt two days a week now, and even though it was a lot, he had hoped for more. A little while later, Alan and the young princess began to leave the carriage, and she told him that they were going to meet the baron, but still he could not understand why she had taken him with her. After all, you have today they meet the eldest son of the baron who is studying at the academy in the capital, but the young lady repeatedly told him to move, but the hero realized that it would be the ultimate punishment if the brother turns out to be the same as the sister. And as soon as they got to the fence, they immediately saw a huge airship, and Alan was shocked at the proximity. The airship is awesome, and he knows it feeds on magical rocks, but still it's amazing to see something with technology. And the fact that there's a clock here in the 12 system, and otherwise it's pretty developed. But at that moment, a young gentleman started to come out of the airship, waving his hand to his sister, and asking how she was doing. But she ran and hugged her brother, saying that she was fine. And as soon as he got closer, he started asking, Who is this new boy? Is he a new servant? But the hero replied that his name is Alan, and he has been a servant since last fall. The young lady started to say that her servant is also a hunter, but her older brother was shocked that her father had already allowed her to take on an extra servant, and this is a rare opportunity for her. After all, this guy. So he should try to please her sister. 
but Alan had no desire to respond to such comments. Michael bent down and began to take out the gift that he brought her from the capital, and as soon as she printed it, she saw a butterfly and began to thank her elder brother. For this gift was very nice, and after that, but the hero carried his things and thought only that they are rarely close for noble children. A little later, our hero's first day of hunting was since Michael showed up and he managed to get five horned rabbits in the legs of a big toad, and that Cecile told him not to return without prey, because she decided to organize again. But it was good to know that he had his vault, but he couldn't figure out how to get it all through such a small hole, and that he was attracting too much attention walking around town like that. And entering the Lord's Manor, he saw that the commander himself was training with his son Michael. And when he saw that Michael was fencing, he was surprised by it. And most of all, he was surprised that it was the first time he had seen a commander bear his sword. And as soon as they finished, the commander started to say that he had improved his skills a lot lately. Mikhail thanked him and said that only he was already 13 and he should not call him young. And as soon as they saw that our hero had returned, the young lady came up to him and began to say that their cook would be happy with what he had brought them. But Michael was surprised to see what a huge creature he had brought home and began to raise his blade asking if he would like to fight it. And as soon as he picked up the mithril sword, he was surprised that it was so huge you see it can only be worn by a commander. And this is his first fight since meeting Kira. While looking at his book, he saw that his status is still in hunting mode, but he wants to fight seriously. On the other side, the Lord's daughter who looked at our hero couldn't understand if he could hold such a huge sword. But Thomas sitting beside her answered her, that of course he had defeated a monster of huge rank so he could easily lift such a sword. And as they prepared for battle, they began to raise their swords and the commander standing between them raised his hand and signaled for the contest to begin. Our hero saw that he could start at a great speed and began to fly towards Mikhail, but still he hoped that he would not be able to seriously injure him. But at the same moment, Michael managed to parry our hero's attack and raised his sword. He said that now it was his turn to attack. And having struck a few blows after which our hero bounced back, not understanding why he so weakly struck after all, he did not even notice his attack. And doesn't he have the speed to strike hard? But this is just more musings. And in this world our hero jumped into the air. And hitting again did not change anything. Because Michael with only one hand was able to repel this attack. Mikhail's mother watched the battle from the sidelines. But the commander told her not to worry because Mikhail had been at the academy for a year. And he wouldn't lose to someone who hadn't been there. And as soon as Michael swung his sword once more, he easily knocked his opponent's sword out of his hands and that was the end of the fight. After lowering his sword, Michael began to say that he was not bad after all, and that it was not for nothing that he was made at such a young age. Our hero replied that he was very grateful to the young master, but he was made a servant only because his father had asked him to do so. Immediately, all the other siblings ran to the battle site and started praising Michael that he had won, and was so fast and Michael replied that he would still be fighting in the dungeons this summer, which made the guys a little bit scared by these words. And they will fight the monsters, and the weaklings will be expelled. But my sister replied that he won't be home this summer. St. Michael began to speak heavily, but Doberg had given him this holy sword. So maybe he'll even have some fun. Alan, who was standing behind him, suddenly realized that he thought he'd heard the name before. And the fact that he's without a dungeon academy and a saint on top of that is what differentiates talent on normal difficulty. But the younger sister and brother kept asking Michael when he would be home again. The latter replied that next spring Alan had asked the young master to fight him again then. Whereupon Michael stretched out his hand and said that he agreed but he must serve his sister well. And as soon as they shook hands, Alan realized he was already acting like a real person. But still he wants to hunt every day. But then he needs to quit the humiliating service of Cecile. But still he did not understand how to do it a few days. Michael returned to the academy and in the head of our hero lodged a wistful thought that even in the end there will be and he also wants in the dungeon. The next day, the lord of the manor said he was honored to have Viscount Carnell in his home. The latter began to reply that his town was so noisy that he was glad to spend a couple of quiet evenings in the middle of nowhere. And while they laughed, our hero brought them food and thought about the fact that Viscount is a title that seems to be higher than Baron. And as soon as he put the food on the table, that man noticed our hero and began to tell him that a black-haired servant is such a rarity. I too must be the very meat of the rare hogs they were so hiding. But Lord replied that he wouldn't dare hide anything from them. And while that man was eating the meat, our hero realized that this is who reported to the king, he unjustified hunting in the baron's domain as a result of which he taxed them. The possessions of both Cornell and Granville lie side by side, and are separated by the natural barrier of the white dragon's spine, and a mithril vein runs along the entire chain of thieves. But since the white dragon lives on Granville's side, Michael's loot thrives only in the possessions of Carnell.
However, 100 years ago, the dragon lived on the territory of Viscount, and the situation was the opposite. And the two domains were constantly feuding over the white dragon and the mithril mines. But whatever their relationship to slander the king about boars is just plain lowly. At this point, the lord began to ask his guest what they owed to today's visit. The Viscount began to answer that a few days ago, his youngest daughter had passed the evaluation ceremony, and he hurried to share the result with him. Our hero heard it realize that his daughter must be the same age as Mash. But suddenly the man laughed and started saying that luckily she was completely talentless. But seeing that the Lord was getting angry with the man said that he didn't mean to hurt their feelings because two of his three children already have talent. But the Lord got up with an angry face and began to say that he too will have a talented child someday, and he too will fulfill his duty as a nobleman like him. But Alan couldn't understand if having talent was so bad and he wouldn't understand these noblemen commoners. He's for talent and then for the sky. And what nobleman's duty are they talking about? Masha or even Kiryana wouldn't have a chance to run if all noblemen's children were born talented. A little later going out to hunt our hero realized that in the fall it will be a year that he works for the grungy family and he is already nine years old and to the village already probably began the hunting season for wild boar and the breath of a dead spider cloak a small resistance to all damage. He was glad that he got such a very material to create a cloak. And the fact that he can gradually get all sorts of equipment, and the fact that he still cannot look at his status, because every day his heart sinks and he feels today he will be able to get five times more experience. Because after destroying 10,000 goblins, he finally raised the level, and crying is probably all over the goblin land. And so today he goes to fight the highest ranking monsters, and releasing his flying beasts, he began to give them orders to quickly find a target he can destroy. And jumping over huge rocks, he finally found the monster Raven mentioned. It was an armadillo ant. And that it's a bug three meters tall, but he still dares to attack it by summoning his tame beasts. And as soon as they started attacking, Fatty realized that this method was not very effective. They simply could not resist him. Because as soon as they approached him, he used his huge tentacles to destroy them with a single blow. Seeing that the tigers are no good, our hero decided to change tactics and release his butterflies to spray pollen and put the ant to sleep. And as soon as they started spraying, the ant took a few deep breaths and fell to the ground. The hero realized that it worked, and that such a monster could be put to sleep like the last one. And I realized that while not 100% effective, he can still hunt white deer that way. And after climbing on his belly, he decided that he was going to finish him off before he woke up. But still he couldn't understand where the wounds that the tiger had inflicted were. And after hitting him a few times, he realized that his attack of 438 damage would be enough. But still looking at his blades, he realized that even his neck could not pierce it. And here you need a better dagger. But at that moment, a huge ant started to wake up. And panicked, he began to strike chaotically because he did not want to miss such a chance to kill such a huge monster. And as soon as he killed it, could get 3.000 experience points. And having done so, he decided to take the magic stones and leave. But still, he could not penetrate its shell with his sword. And no matter how many blows he threw, he realized he couldn't get to him and still not understanding how the hell he was going to get the stones he shared a little, he decided he was going to look for the orc. And wandering through the woods, our hero came upon some kind of a two-meter tall giant. And this was a huge C-rank orc. And looking in his book, he realized that his creature never gets tired. But monsters need to sleep. And it's so relevant and a good time to attack. For while he slept, he prepared many of his summoned animals, tasked with attacking the orc. And it actually worked because the orc didn't expect this. And while he was recovering, he was badly wounded. But swinging the RD with his spear, he began to attack back. And the fact that he couldn't take out three men with one punch. But it was hard to scare our hero, because he kept summoning his tigers. And yet by pouncing all together, they were able to destroy such a huge enemy. And as soon as the org was destroyed, the hero received 1.500 experience points and realized that this is who he will now destroy. Because after all, he even managed to carve the magic stone. But still he wondered if he would need a lot of them because he killed the monster early and didn't even use the traps. And that it was a great achievement for him. But still, he was upset that he was beaten by a 15-year-old kid from the academy. So, he's a total dog. And academy graduates like the knight commander and his deputy are probably much stronger than Michael and his deputy. Besides, five-year-old Catherine lost. And the graduates of this academy are very powerful people. They are generally not more than 1% of the population, and he should earn more experience and become stronger than them. But now, the next goal is to kill two orcs at a time, and with the help of his birds, he started looking for them. And as a result for today, he killed one armadillo ant and 15 orcs and got 25.000 experience. 
and the fact that he gained a maximum of 25.000 experience go away, and today he would cope with 40 orcs in a day, and it will be 60.000 experience, and from now on, he should be called the killer of orcs. And in early November, the young lady started asking Alan not to say anything rude to the teacher. After all, today he was called to attend classes with Asel as a reward for a year of hard service. And as soon as they came to the teacher, he started asking if he had any questions for him. Without thinking, Alan began to ask under what conditions it is possible to use mine, because his talent is a summoner and he has one hypothesis. The summoner's intelligence growth is set to S, and with the level increase it became easier to learn, so maybe intelligence is needed to learn magic. But the young lady decided to say that he has no talent. Why would he know about it? But the teacher interrupted her and said that he was a student today, too, and that he would try to explain it in brief. And that everything is very simple. You need a talent that allows you to use magic such as mage or sage. Without it, you cannot get any spell. But our hero realized it was all useless to him. But the teacher went on to say that Lady Cecil couldn't use Maria yet either. Alan still couldn't figure out what kind of magician she was. But Cecile got angry and started asking her teacher to give her a crystal ball. And as soon as she picked up the crystal ball, it began to glow brightly. And then she said she had magic. But our hero also wanted to try. And the teacher agreed that he could see for himself. And as soon as he stood near my cruel circle and decided to see how to summon how the summoner was friendly with magic. And just a few seconds later, the master said that magic was ultimately unavailable to him. But he still couldn't understand why he needed intelligence. Because someone like him can't swing a sword or use magic and what's in it for him. And in the end, this hypothesis was disproved. A little later, he went into the store and picked up everything the young mistress had asked for. And coming out of the stores, he heard a conversation of men who said that the monsters surrounded him on all sides, and he already thought that he was finished here came this boy and saved him. But the hero replied that he was just following the orders of the Lord, and he should not worry about it. Another man who was standing behind our hero asked that, Are you the hunter of the Granville family? And it's been a year since he was officially authorized to hunt monsters, and somehow in the city he has a lot of acquaintances. But at that moment, the hero noticed that a lot of people began to sort out who went where and he could not understand what was going on here. And when he caught up with the adventurers, he started asking them where they were all running to. To which the adventurer began to answer that there appeared a terrible, giant, evil Mardragash right near the south gate. Alan decided to ask if they were going to fight him, and they all said no way. Only the strongest man in their domain, the commander of the knights, could do that. But neither he nor his deputy are here now. They can only get people away before things get really bad. Alan realized that it's a bad thing because most of the adventurers in town don't have talents so they can't fight such a monster. And that helping to fight monsters is a hunter's duty to the Granvin family and the Baron will forgive him if he interferes. And starting to run a lot faster, he said in an interesting way that he would run and scout out the situation. And as soon as he ran to the main gate, he saw that most of the people had started to scatter in different directions. But still, there weren't many wounded people. The guards who were standing near the gate began to tell the others not to let him enter the city, and they should close the main gate now. But the man standing near them began to ask them not to close the gate, because there is still his carriage there. But near that carriage was that horrible monster that started destroying the horses. And as soon as our hero looked at him, he realized he was four or five feet tall and how can he beat him now? And as soon as that huge monster began to take his huge paw carriage in which sat a woman with a child, our hero suddenly began to move towards the carriage, but the guards standing in the same place simply petrified from fear. And as he walked, he started pulling a huge iron ball out of his inventory. And without a second thought, he threw it with all his strength straight at the monster and hit it in the right eye. And right after the hit, the hero realized that it was bound to get his attention and ran even closer. He started distracting him by saying that he was going to kill him. And ran up behind the carriage, Alan continued shouting, What's the matter? Why isn't he paying attention to him? The guard standing at the same place could not understand what he was doing and why he was teasing him. Adventurers shouted to our hero to stop provoking him because he might just die. And as soon as the hero realized that he fell for his trick, Monster began to turn slowly in his direction. But the hero realized that he is now in trouble because his mana is gone. And only three hours ago, he spent it all on training. At the same moment, a huge monster was at his back swinging, he struck. But our hero managed to dodge by jumping to the side. And when he turned around, he saw that the monster was looking at him strangely. And seeing his smile, Hero couldn't understand why he was looking at him and smiling so strangely. And could it be that he was simply laughing with him? And while that monster was smiling happily, our hero remembered that his brother Masha seems to be named after him. And his father, he comes up with the lamest of names. 
and gathering all his strength into a fist because his mana had almost resumed he began to summon his book, and as soon as he was able to increase his agility and defense to dodge it so moved from his seat, he started running towards the forest. But the monster didn't hesitate long to run after him. The adventurers who looked at it all realized that he used himself as bait, but the knight standing in a stupor could not move from the place. But at the same time, our hero continued to remove from the monster through the forest. And once they were away from the city, the hero began to call his animals to put the monster to sleep. But as soon as the butterflies flew up to the monster, it was destroyed in one blow. And after some time, our hero still managed to get away from the monster and hiding behind a tree, he realized that he had lost. And the fact that his debuffs don't work on him and that monster is impossible to defeat, but now the most important thing is that he can't figure out what he should do. But nevertheless, having gathered his thoughts, he realized that it's all right. He will pump a lot and will definitely take revenge on him. And at least he took him far away from the city. But at that moment, he began to hear behind his back some strange noise. And turning his head, he saw that the monster had torn off the tree he was hiding behind. And then our hero realized he was in trouble. And as he continued to run away, the hero still screamed at the top of his voice that this monster was very persistent. And after three days, the knights who were near the main gate saw in the distance some silhouette. And as he came closer, they saw that it was our little hero who simply fell down in front of his feet. And the knight started to lift him up and told him that it was not proper to fall down. And then they started to call the doctor and quickly told the baron that Alan had been found. And being inside the palace, our hero began to come to his senses. And opening his eyes, he saw in front of him his little mistress, who told him that he had slept for two days in a row, but still how he feels now. And as soon as he was fully up, she started saying that since he was her personal servant, it was only natural that she was worried if he wanted food or drink he could just ask, only happy that he survived. But looking at the butler, he started to say that as soon as he comes to his senses, he must go to the baron with a report, and that Hero realized that he had intervened without permission, and probably the baron is now torn in swords. But as soon as he walked in on the baron, he started asking him what he was thinking. But Alan replied that he could only run away and he regrets that he did so of his own free will and apologizes for it. But the Baron couldn't understand what he was apologizing for. For the protection of the people is the doctor, and on behalf of all the knights he thanks him for performing this duty in their absence. And in this case, he has done nothing wrong, and thanks to him, the city is almost unharmed. And his reward is ten coins, and another ten from the family whose carriage he saved he gets twenty gold coins. And as soon as our hero saw it, he realized that the Baron was so generous and now he'll buy a better weapon than some rusty sword and immediately run to the armory. But the defense went on to say that the next time he hunts monsters, he should not go far from the city. Smiling, the hero realized that everything had gone surprisingly smoothly and replied to the baron that of course he would now be more careful. The next day our hero found an ant that he couldn't kill last time, but now he simply swung his new sword and killed it in one blow. And he was once because he had bought the mythical sword and was now in hard. And besides, he had made a remarkable discovery. The new summoned monsters have all the memories of the previous ones. And his bird still remembers that fight and still keeps track of that monster he escaped from. And while our hero was walking his draft, it's like a generic memory. Not remember everything and learn from your mistakes. A giant D-ranked bird and a ferocious goblin. C-ranked monsters that no adventurer can handle alone. And finally, the true horror of the monster bee deadly to humans. And duel again in the spring after the return of the eldest son of the Granvelle family. He's leveled up a bit, but he still swings faster than him by a factor of 100. And as soon as the commander-in-chief waved his hand, the battle began. And without any regrets or doubts, Michael started throwing a lot of punches. The young lady who was watching the fight couldn't understand if she had become weaker. At that moment, Michael landed several more blows and still took the weapon out of Alan's hands, who started to say he was giving up, but he was actually very angry that he couldn't win, and he's been training hard and he should be stronger than last year. After the battle, the commander-in-chief came to Michael and told him that he had brought a great fight. But Michael was very surprised because he noticed that Alan had become so strong. And as soon as they shook hands, our hero told Mr. Michael that he was still growing up compared to him. But Michael replied that he could rest easy knowing that he was a servant of the Cecil. But then his little sister came up to him and whispered in his ear that he needed more training in swordsmanship. And a little later, sitting at the table, Michael began to ask our hero, did he really fight with Mardarsh? But the younger sister answered that he ran away from him for three days, and after that slept two days as dead, and that he had a very hard time. But here was the younger brother asking Michael if he could defeat him, that he couldn't defeat a rank B monster by himself yet. 
and in that case he needs to work harder. But at that moment a knight burst into the room and approached the Lord very quickly. But Lord himself could not understand what happened, but the knight said that the white dragon flew to another place, and Lord could not believe his own ears. Alan was also surprised because he'd heard of it, and it's an A-rank monster that's been living in the mountains for hundreds of years. But the knight went on to say that the adventurers had seen the dragon fly into the lands of Cornelius, and trembling with fear the Lord still said that at last he had decided to fly over, and how long did it take him, and that it should be used sooner rather than later, because he can ask them to explore the area of Michael's mines, and first they need to find a new dragon's lodge, and then they can look at the four areas with deposits, and that there are high-level goblins and orcs in the mountain forests, and it's going to take months. But when the Lord heard this, he told them he was relying on their, the older brother began to say that he had a feeling that the story itself had been set in motion and that finally the townspeople would be happy because it was great news. But still, Michael added that he might come back here next year. And when his mother heard that, she said he was probably right because there's a chance the dragon will come back. So they should keep the information secret. Well, our hero has realized the problem and now will seriously deal with the consequences of the monsters and all this experience and that he needs to hurry up. And as soon as the new month of July began, the amount of experience of our hero reached the mark of one million and the skill of synthesis was raised to the fifth level and also received the skill of exchange and that today he raised a lot of skills. And now that he made sure that the white dragon flew into the land of Carnell, it is time to check his characteristics. He can't wait to find out what kind of D-rank creatures he can summon. But first he decided to try the exchange skill because he hopes it will be as useful as the inventory. And after a moment, the hero realized that this is how his bird sees, and he can simultaneously look with his eyes and the eyes of his bird. And that's what the ability to exchange means. And as soon as the bird took off, our hero has a very exciting feeling and they share the same hearing too. And it's like he's flying on this bird. And that he can even use the skill of eagle eyes, and he can see everything it is a few kilometers away from him, and that this bird, after all, flew beyond a radius of 50 M, and after all he in it, his zone of influence, he can improve the orders. But now he realized that he can control it completely at such a great distance. And it's similar to how players control multiple characters at once, and the intelligence parameters of the summoned creature should be higher, so and it can also establish a connection with several at once. But each creature requires 200 points of actual intelligence, and his 1.200 intelligence will yield six creatures at once, and then he realized how the summoner's intelligence is used, and he thought this parameter was just an overkill. And after thinking about it, he decided it was time to summon new creatures because he had collected 10,000 high-ranking stones. And as soon as he summoned the new creatures, he realized that all but the potatoes had intelligence above 100. And so they must understand, and he could arrange an exchange with them. But it's sad that he won't be able to summon Tama now. But they can talk like Hawk. But only now has our hero realized that he understands orders and can use the swap. Which means that the creatures he summoned can hunt on their own, and now he needs to check it out soon. And as soon as he got to the huge ant he started calling for his web. And as soon as the web tied the ant began ordering his beast bear to attack. And just a few minutes later, the huge ant was destroyed. And our hero rejoiced that, although not with a single blow, but his creature was able to cope with it on its own. And what he's got is the brigade a completely autonomous group of summoned beings. And the fact that the search for enemies will take Horo and Hawk, and that the skill in the Temple Surge will increase the chance of dodging allies. And the fact that without them the number of creatures in the group will not be restored, so they must keep a close eye on the debuff, and that the bears are still huge and our hero decided that he can rely on them. Because if the bears switch between attack and defense, they will not lose for anything. And now he knows that sharing works even when he sleeps, and he has the perfect squad that will earn him 30 days of experience. And yet as he left, he gave another order that they were not to approach the men, and that if they were struck, they were not to fight them back. And parted with his squad, our hero realized that this is a very cool ability. Although he looks with eyes 86 and does not feel any discomfort at all, and it seems that he is gradually becoming great and terrible, and now he can in every way to use increasing radius of movement. But at that moment, he realized that the white dragon lurked behind the mountain, and he thought of another way he could use the swap. A little later in our hero's village, he saw Catherine practicing with the dragoon, and that they were preparing for battle as it were. And after a moment, Catherine began throwing many punches at her opponent who was skillfully defending himself. And a little later, she started telling Masha that it was his turn to train. Well, our hero's father looked up into the sky and saw some familiar bird that started flying towards their house. As soon as he looked out the window, I saw his mother sitting with his little sister. And once it was done, 
She said she finished her braid, which made the girl thank her mother. But at that moment, they heard a strange sound and a gold coin fell at their feet. At this time, our hero was in the mansion and realized that now he will fly to them every month and through this exchange can help them and see how they are doing. And on the 10th month, our hero turned 10 years old and has already been working here for two years. The Lord who sat at the table began to say that they had worked hard for six months exploring the area. And so what about his mithril mines? The commander-in-chief began to answer that as he had feared these lands had not been trodden by man for 100 years, and no wonder there were so many monsters breeding there. And not only at the four mines, but also in the village where they used to process the mine and need to clean up the area by hiring workers to establish transportation links, and it will take at least three years to get a second response. But the Lord was shocked to hear about the three years, and began to say that he was of course asking for the impossible, but they must hurry. And yet he wondered how things were now in the lands of Cornell. The commander-in-chief began to answer that since the Viscount's domain continued to produce mithril, I was summoned to some dragon realized that it was all about the production of mithril. Our hero standing nearby heard the whole conversation and realized that it was good that they sent a bird there to admire the dragon, and probably has his own version of the eagle eye. Although I'm a little early for him to get on the A-rank monsters, Lord suddenly began to tell the others that because the work at the mines has become unbearable, Viscount probably doesn't know what to do, and they will be watching his reaction. In the meantime, they should go to the mines and follow the plan, but Alan didn't really like the idea because now the poor monsters will be cut down by the roots. But still at this time, and the hero received notifications that one org was killed and received thousands of 500 experience, and he realized that he will have time to prepare for six months. And as soon as he turns 13, he leaves the mansion and becomes an adventurer and only has two years left. But he pays them favors and helps them open the mines. And in the end, he can't put the whole experience to some knights. At the top of the world where eternal snows meet the heavens, the legend of Archimere begins, of the highest difficulty, the wind of old whispers, whirling between the rocks. In the shadows of the mountain peaks, where a forgotten spell slumbers, ants weave underground labyrinths. Behind the ants, their eagerness is heard echoing in the walls of stony soil. In a village of orcs where strength is valued above words, the orc king reigns supreme. His will is law, his hand is justice, and deep within the ant nests, rules the Lion King of Ants, wise and unyielding in his quest for order. The daredevil whose heart is full of courage declares, My goal is to defend this goblin village, for the knights are close, and their footsteps can be heard in the silence of the forest. The goblins, anticipating the impending threat, are fortifying their lines. They have surrounded the village with a fence and even put guards in front of the gate, so security measures are put into strictness. Even the lesser goblins' weapons in hand are ready to defend their own. Of course, they're not allowed to show their weakness in front of adults. Youth and bravery intertwine, creating a generation of fearless warriors. A whole lot of greatness of bones, exclaimed the guards as they surveyed the endless remains. Orcs are ready for battle. They are hungry for victory and do not spare their enemies. But in the midst of darkness and danger, one young hero is ready to stand up to evil. But now, with knights on my tail, his eyes full of determination. He faces the test, surrounded by giants from the insect world. I'll have to cut them all out. The task seems impossible. The battle begins, and the magic word Harami triggers a burst of magic. The power of a young warrior is unleashed to cleanse the land of darkness. The fight begins with a shout of clang. The magical creatures are ready for battle. Their power stats flicker in the air, promising a brutal bout. Men, attack! The Orc King commands. His troops, drawn from the bravest of warriors, rush into battle. The collision is powerful, Gra, resounding like thunder across the battlefield. Orcs fight with insane fury, leaving no chance for mercy. But the laughter of the giant bears, Gra ha ha ha, echoes over the battlefield. The battle becomes even more fierce and the outcome is impossible to predict. The orcs are not backing down. With each instant of clang from their weapons, the tension grows. Spider, shoot down the arrows, the raid! commands the wise man among the insects. The war between species is reaching its climax. Grah! There's a shout of triumph. Each fallen enemy enhances the young hero's experience. One goblin killed. 200 experience points gained. His progress is displayed. There's a whole horde of them. The hero doesn't hide his surprise. He realizes that the battle has only just begun, and there are greater challenges ahead. The battlefield was ringed with many cries of gra, pa, Twa, these are the sounds of battle, where every fighter is ready to defend his side to the last. The hero, gazing into the churning sea of enemies, admits, I could count from above, 
but I think there are 200 or 300 of them here. He realizes that his brigade can't handle so many enemies without his help. Men kill them all, no mercy. Sounds the order, and the hero does not hesitate to prepare for decisive action to change the outcome of the battle. Gra! Sounds around again, but the hero does not give up, driven by his duty and willpower. There's no use running, he whispers, absorbed in reading spells, preparing a new round of magic. pira a a a a screams Echo in a raging battle where every blow can be decisive. Victory is ours! Hope explodes from the warriors, but the enemy does not relent. And now they can gnaw on a one-two. War shows its cruelty. Out of the darkness emerges the guise of the mightiest. The common king. The one before whom the lands tremble. Almost missing my own funeral, the hero remarks ironically as he watches the chaos unfold. Oh, showed up at last. And you can see the spark in his eyes that heralds a new turn of events. Zerk, the leader of the enemies, shouts, My creatures have been killing C-rank enemies by the thousands. But the enemies in front of him are no mere enemies. Goop, Guga. The Goblin King's last words are silenced, and the hero gains 4,200 experience points. Victory is at hand. The hero commands, Finish off the goblins and herd their corpses into the center of the village. His words are law to his remaining enemies. He leaves the battlefield where every step has been echoed by the battle. It was a lot of work, but at least I have so many magic stones now. The hero is already thinking about the future. The only thing left to do is to get rid of them so they're not here to fight. The hero knows his mission is nearing completion. The fire in the hero's inventory never goes out. How convenient. He's using it to finish the job. This concludes the defense of the goblin village. The hero exclaims in relief as he sees the flames consuming the aftermath of the battle. May a long peace await you, the hero says to the fallen. He doesn't know how long it will last, but for now the task is accomplished. And with each step of withdrawal, his experience grows. 48,800 points for defending the village. Life returns to its normal flow. Something's getting a little boring. We should check on the orcs, the hero pondered as he looked at the smoking ruins. In a few months and a good walk around the neighborhood and raise the level, he notes of the progress made during his adventures. Return to a world where the war is behind us and friends are waiting to continue their studies and training. Now we'll all be together again. The joy of reunion shines in the eyes of the young. And while peaceful days flow, memories of battles and adventures remain. Blondie doesn't look happy, the hero remarks. The mysteries of the past and the future are yet to be unraveled. Fight me, but only seriously, as hard as you can, the hero challenges, perhaps looking for a new adventure in a quieter setting. The atmosphere is really different now and the hero is pensive. I don't know why he needs it, but I don't mind crossing swords once again. Very well, if such is your wish, I will tell with you in full force, the seasoned warrior replies, accepting the young hero's challenge. The story continues and the hero is already thinking about the next steps with the keys to new knowledge and powers in his hands. I'm in pre-red shape now, he states with confidence, ready for the next challenge on his path. Aden begins a duel filled with the seriousness and gravity of the moment. Thank you. The gratitude in your opponent's eyes reflects respect for a challenge that is taken with complete seriousness. The hero's speed is amazing, almost twice as much as last year. Now the victory will be mine. He's ready to prove his superiority, but the opponent doesn't relent. Damn, he was able to defend himself. Even at this speed, swords crossed equal. This is a true competition of the masters. The hero's movements are swift and decisive. You're waiting, aren't you? Do you know I'm faster than you? He's determined to show his skills. With each moment, the duel becomes more intense. Ring, ring, ring. The sound of swords striking. The spectators are watching the fight in suspense. Some are worried. Is the brother behind? Aiden. But the hero quickly realizes his opponent's advantage. Is he reading my mind? I'm faster than him after all, so why is he fending off all my attacks? The battle reaches a new level of strategy and skill. The tension of the battle is reaching a climax. Shit, shit, shit. Frustration and elation mixed in one rush. I'm so totally going to win this year. The hero's confidence leaves no doubt about his intentions. The fight is over. With abruptness and surprise, the duel ends, leaving spectators and participants in amazement. No, an attack like that with everything else. I can't ignore that. The loser ponders, trying to learn a lesson from the fight. Thank you. The hero is grateful for the lesson, for the opportunity to face a strong opponent. As expected of a grand lie hunter, you surprise me even more this year. Recognizing his opponent speaks volumes about the stature and strength of the character. Michael sets the pace of the conversation, but it feels a bit tense. What? No handshake this year? 
bewilderment is in the air. Gratitude and respect are echoed in his father's words. Thank you very much. Three years in the Academy of Born Fruit. You've become much more experienced. Then, was that all he needed? We'll arrange the mayflies like he asked. And so, despite the trials of war, the family ties remain strong. But still not as strong as brother Mihai. You've gotten strong. His sister admires his progress. My sister's enthusiasm shines through in her words. Maybe I should study too. I'd be very happy if that's possible. Mikhail shares the news unexpectedly, introducing a shadow of alarm. Listen, there's something I need to tell you. And so, Michael's revelation. For the next three years, I will happily live for the good of the kingdom. The duties of his name. Michael's apology adds weight to the moment. I'm sorry it's so sudden and you can sense the anticipation of new adventures in his words. The sister worriedly asks, When does this service start? Michael's answer is shrouded in mystery. I'm sorry, I can't tell you that. Stunned, she learns that as of tomorrow, Michael will leave for duty. Change comes suddenly, altering plans and dreams. Her parents stand by her side, supportive, but their faces show mixed feelings. The mother smiles sadly, remembering the recent joyous moments of reunion. Michael turns to his sister with a promise. It's going to be okay. I'll be back in three years. His words are filled with encouragement and hope. Don't worry. I'll write to you as often as I can. He promises as he prepares for a new chapter of his life. The heaviness of goodbye filled the air. Not mom, not Cecilia, is heard in a whisper full of sorrow and tenderness. The head of the family says with importance, and you too will fulfill the duty of a nobleman. Someday you'll have a child with talent. He addresses his children, foreshadowing a future full of trials and triumphs. Worry lurked in the younger brother's eyes. I have a bad feeling about this. He senses an impending storm of change. The older brother is surprised at the younger brother's ignorance. Strange. So even after working at the mansion for 12 years, he didn't learn anything. I haven't heard of anything special. Are the words of a man who knows more than he reveals? The looks are full of questions and bewilderment. Is he wearing armor? The younger brother can't hide his surprise. The heaviness of goodbye is felt in every gesture, every word. Cecilia, don't be silent. Say goodbye to him. Mother gently reminds me of the importance of the moment. A goodbye hug is full of emotion. I'll see you again. Sister, Michael's words are accompanied by tears. The father's words are filled with pride and love. Do your duty and come home soon. You are the pride of the grand grand granny family. Heartfelt farewells resound in the air. Good journey, Mr. Michael. The quiet words accompany the young man on his new journey. The older brother looks at the younger brother with bewilderment and determination. Ah, Emily, take care of Cecile. Protect her. He entrusts the care of his sister to the younger one, showing him trust and responsibility. Doubt flashes in the younger's eyes as he watches his brother leave. Is he an arrow high, or was it just me? He wondered, trying to understand his brother's intentions. And so, step by step, Michael rushes forward. So, I set out to do my duty as a son of the Granville family. His words are full of determination and calling, leading him down the path of honor and duty. The family says goodbye to Mikhail. I'll be waiting for you. Be sure to come back. His sister waves her hand, sending her brother on his way. The younger brother stands looking thoughtfully at his sister as she walks away, reminding himself, I'll have to keep my promise and protect her. Time passes, and it's been two months since Michael left. Since October, I've been diligently mopping up all the goblin villages. He's thinking about his exploits. And here stands before us a young hero, already more experienced and stronger. I've leveled up and I'm ready to level up some more. His eyes are determined and ready for a new challenge. Hidden amongst the foliage, a young warrior sneaks around, heading towards the source of the noise. The fisherman will get here too, so we need to hurry, he whispers to himself, emphasizing the urgency of the mission. Looking up, he sees a village below, shrouded in the shadows of huge birds. The village is ruled by a V-Rang monster I haven't killed yet. An orc king, he thinks, as he feels adrenaline fill his body. He approaches the goblin village, his creatures already in position. I'll trap and kill them all. The determination is read in every movement as he plans his attack. Suddenly a majestic knight, armed to the teeth, appears before him. This time I have also called for a defense against enemy gunners and an orc king. He prepares for battle, knowing that every fight could be his last. Surrounded by giant bears and creatures armed to the teeth, the young warrior stands firm. Our first hunt in the orc village is now open, the goblins declare as they prepare to attack. So guys, he begins, and at the same moment a menacing march is heard from the other side, the monsters moving forward ready for battle. The orca bears, raising their swords and spears, shout their battle cry, 
Pee hee. This sound heralds the beginning of a fight in which every blow can be decisive. The warrior looks at his opponents with a smile. They know how to fight them. It'll be easy, he thinks, and his confidence fills his allies with strength for battle. Steel meets steel as the orc bears advance. Armor, asterisk, defense, asterisk, screams the warrior, taking cover from the flying arrows. Arrows rain down on him like rain, the sounds of their strikes merging into one incessant noise. The air vibrates with the tension of battle. One of the bears bursts through the volleys of arrows with a roar. So many arrows, he cries out, dodging spears coming at him from all directions. So far they've fought without knowing fatigue, but surely they'll die if they take a lot of damage, the warrior pondered as he assessed the situation. I wish I could see how much life force my creatures have left, he looks at his allies with regret. Oh, he moved the shot. Notes with amazement the hero, observing the fearlessness of his comrade. Disarm the archers! The warrior commands his creatures and they immediately move swiftly forward. Avi gonna keep going. Attack! The hero directs his subordinates at the enemy using tactical advantage. The orc army responds by preparing its own powerful offensive. With each step, the ground trembles under the weight of their armored boots. They're standing them up here? Or is it all toosty? Wondered the warrior surveying the battlefield. He is preparing to see the full picture of the collision to understand how best to proceed. In battle excitement, the warrior exclaims, Yum, yum, how much experience am I going to get here? His eyes sparkle with the anticipation of victory and the reward of battle. Crush them, men! He shouts to his warriors as he leads them into battle. Strategy and power combine in his every move. It's time for a squad from the other side to join the fight, too. He orders, coordinating the attack from different flanks to ensure superiority. The great battle is inevitably approaching its climax. I've killed a hundred orcs already, but I don't see their king yet. Everything is going according to plan, but still, the mopping up is taking longer than I've been keeping the goblins. The warrior ponders, weighing his next move in this massive game of survival. What? Suddenly a question interrupts the rhythm of the battle. The warrior turns around to see the reason for his surprise. From above from the heavens something huge falls, causing surprise and alarm. Armor! Asterisk defense asterisk. Instinctively, he shouts, preparing himself for an unexpected threat. The explosion blows everything around and the hero at the last moment calls upon magic to strengthen his defenses. Magic! His voice is full of determination and focus. A dark figure emerges from the smoke and dust. Is this the king of the orcs? Doubt runs through his gaze while he tries to figure out if he's finally face to face with a major threat. The warrior watches for monsters that use magic. First time I see enemies. He barely has time to finish the thought when danger is looming. Did they... they're aiming at me? Confusion is replaced by the realization that he's a prime target. They're attacking again. Armor asterisk defense asterisk. Without wasting a second, he summons his defenses again, countering the magical attack. What? The question freezes in midair, but he was able to fend off the attack. Like hot coals, his determination and courage won't let him give up. Immediately, the orc mages began attacking the hero. And that's when Alan realized he no longer had his bronx in reserve. But as soon as he threw his iron ball, he was able to kill one of the orc mages. And he's still got two iron balls left, so he can kill them all. On the battlefield, where the echoes of explosions intermingle with screams, the young hero is horrified to realize that the enemies are attacking from cover. Damn, they're attacking from cover. His voice is drowned out by the rumble of another explosion. The enemy's strategy is clear. Exhaust their forces and resources. Suddenly he is struck with fear, for the orcs have not yet used up their entire arsenal. And yet there are still a hundred orcs left. It's like I'm in hell. He whispers, wiping sweat from his forehead, eyes full of despair. But surrendering is not his policy. And I'll put everything on the attack. Since that's the case, I'll waive the defense. The determination in his gaze is unwavering. He's ready to take the fight to the ground. That's when he remembers the card is a magic pod that can restore a thousand mana. With her and a hundred magic pods, he could summon twenty thousand bears, a small army capable of turning the tide of battle. Chances are he already holds the key to victory in his hand. In a world where magic art fights dark forces, our hero has the unique ability to summon powerful warrior bears. Until I run out of mana, he shouts, preparing for battle. His army of bears stands like a fortress in the face of an unknown threat. But the enemy is relentless. The answer to his summons is the night fog, pierced by a whispered, Be he! A shadow creeps through the narrow streets, heralding the arrival of something powerful. Tension rises. The air vibrates with the anticipation of collision. And then there is thunder. 
and there is no more time to think. A giant enemy bursts out of the fog, its cry of woe, oh, 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 reverberating off the walls. It's not just a fight. It's a duel of titans where every step could be your last. Our hero doesn't hesitate. With the words, by Zansa, he answers the summons, ready to use the last of his magical energy reserves. The echoes of his magic echo through the air, and a battle that will go down in legends begins. Bears versus monster, art versus power, light versus shadow. There's determination in our hero's eyes. Beware! He meets the gaze of a huge creature sparkling with magical energy. The Dark Lord, Mara Ragarish, pulls his spells from the depths of the night, causing even the hearts of the brave bears to tremble. The majestic Orc King, armed to the teeth, stands forward. His battle cry of Orc King echoes across the battlefield as if it were a challenge to fate itself. This becomes a test not only of courage but also of our hero's skill. With each step, the bears seem smaller and smaller in the face of this colossus. Are they really four meters tall? The hero is perplexed as he sees his creatures rushing into battle despite the size difference. The battle heats up with renewed vigor, and brave sounds like a hymn of bravery. Bears, despite their size, take up the challenge, becoming a symbol of indomitable will and proving that true strength lies not in size, but in the heart. In one fell swoop, our hero explodes with energy, his eyes burning with determination. The spells swiftly replaced each other, creating a whirlwind of magical power. He is not just a warrior. He is a magician artist, painting the fate of the battle on the canvas of the world. Summoning, amplifying, creating. The three stages of magic he must coordinate to win. Every movement is a touch to the picture of triumph. He won't back down until the last drop of ink is used up. But the Orc King is relentless. Things are bad. They're being killed faster than I can summon. A grim reality dawns on the hero. The enemy's attack radius is too large. The bears have nowhere to hide. And then silence. No. They killed Brona. The hero's words are drowned in the noise of battle. He realizes he has lost not just a warrior, but a friend. There's only one thing left to do. Keep fighting. Be he. The echoes of battle do not subside, but only spur his will to win. Despite the circumstances, the hero does not lose hope. Ask for me, bears. His voice is full of despair and faith at the same time. Seeing his bears disappear one by one, he summons the last reserves of his will. A mysterious card slips from his sleeve. Hmm. He ponders, sinking into deep strategic thoughts. The card's special skill is magical fruit, restores 1,000 mana. This may be his chance for a turning point in the battle. What's to be done? That way they'll all be slaughtered soon enough. Fear and determination struggling in his heart. Time is playing against him, and every choice could prove fatal. He knows that the outcome of the battle depends on his decision. He hesitates. Wait for the king to get tired. Wait for them to run out of mana. But on the battlefield there is no room for doubt. We must act. And the fire in his eyes lights up again. The fire of hope and determination to take the fight to the end. The battle had reached a critical point. Is this really the end? The hero whispers, looking at his empty hands. But then there is an unexpected twist. The appearance of a new character. Hmm. Looks like you're having a hard time here. The stranger says with a confident smile. The hero is puzzled. I saw smoke so I thought I'd check it out. The new hero brings with him not only power, but mystery. What the hell? I thought you were coming tomorrow, exclaims our hero when confronted with unexpected help. The mysterious warrior only smiles. Just thought I'd stop by to visit the orcs. It seems his appearance is no accident, and he knows more than he's showing. What else are you doing here? He asks the question, pointing to his presence as a chance. The hero's fate once again hangs in the balance, but now he has an ally perhaps the key to unraveling this chaos. Who would have thought you'd bring the living here? The hero ponders, his gaze full of hope. An unexpected ally turns his attention to the battlefield. Shit, he killed my animals. With despair, the hero sees his creatures fall. What's that? Calmly asks the new arrival, just assessing the situation. Come back! In despair, the hero calls out to his bears, but his words seem powerless against the might of the enemy. The enemy might really think they're just ordinary monsters. Just ignored my beasts? The hero can't believe his magic is so easily dismissed. The enemy stands imposing and unwavering, as if he has been waiting for this moment. The ally, however, remains unfazed. Though come to think of it, I hear he can handle a Mararagarish as well. Strength and confidence are present in his voice. The hero begins to realize that before him is not just a warrior, 
but the strongest knight of the House of Grandeval, and he apparently didn't hesitate before the Orc King. Vice Captain Reed Rant, the rescuer introduces himself, his gaze piercing and confident. I killed the Orc King. I leave the rest to you. He suggests the hero finish what he started, leaving the way open for his own victory. The hero meets his gaze with a mixture of surprise and gratitude. It's been a long time. Come for freebies too then, boy brick for battle? Reed Rant jokingly throws in, noting the hero's rough journey. To see how the professionals work, the hero replies, ready to learn from the best. Raid Rant walks on, his back indicating that he has no doubts about the hero's abilities. Hey, that was actually my experience. The hero doesn't want to be overshadowed by the vice captain, but now he knows that his path is not only battles, but also teaching, and he must walk it himself. The depictions of the two warriors, the spearman and the swordsman, emphasize the difference in their paths and fighting styles. The orcs continue to advance, their ranks endless. The orc king is fast and has a large attack radius, the hero reminds himself as he prepares for another challenge. Reed Rant, despite his strength, left the fight with the remaining enemies to the young mage. Isn't he too all stumpy? The hero is worried, but his doubts are instantly dispelled. Raid Rant comes face to face with the mighty orc, his cry of tumo o o o o o o o echoing in the air. And here's the moment of impact. Raid Rant walks towards the enemy without fear, his steely gaze and powerful stride demonstrating his unwavering warrior spirit. The force of his strike is lightning fast, and even huge orcs can't withstand the onslaught. This battle is not just about swords and magic, but also lessons for the hero. He realizes that every fight is a step toward mastery, and that even in the shadow of the greats, there is room for growth and victory. The battle reaches its climax. Vice Captain Reed Rant, with impeccable skill, deflects a blow from a huge orc. This moment, filled with energy and drama, is forever etched in the memory of every witness of the battle. After the storm of battle comes a well-deserved rest. At a table in the tavern, Captain Richard toasts the bravery of his comrades for those moments when they stood shoulder to shoulder against unimaginable foes. Zinor the war demon is how they pronounce Raid Rant's name, marveling at his unrivaled strength and bravery. He becomes a legend, a symbol of fearlessness and power, the embodiment of the ideal of the warrior. But the true hero of this story is a young mage who, despite the full might of the vice captain, finds the strength to stand and fight. Looks like he's pissed off, thinks the hero, looking at the enraged orc, and realizes that his ordeal is just beginning. Vice Captain Reed Rant meets the enemy warrior's attack with fearlessness. His weapons and manner of combat glisten, deflecting the onslaught of a mighty foe. His fame grows with every moment of the fight, and he truly deserves the title of Great Warrior. The power of his strike is unwavering, as is his determination. With a shout of tumo o o o o o o o he demonstrates his skill, forcing his opponent to retreat. These moments of battle become legend, told from generation to generation. The young mage, watching the scene, feels excitement and admiration. He holds his punches and he can't take a beating. He can't help but recognize the skill of the vice captain, who stands unwavering in the face of danger and is ready for any challenge. Reed Rant's strength and confidence inspire the hero. So that's what he is, Captain Reed Rant, the young mage thinks, learning from the vice captain and intending to use this lesson for his future battles. Raid Rant stands unwavering before the orc army, their sinister figures filling the horizon. So they're the ones who started this fire? His cold gaze examines the enemy as he assesses the situation. With every movement the vice captain makes, the tension builds and the air around him shakes with the anticipation of battle. The young mage watches as his mentor prepares to face the crowd alone. And so Reed Rant enters the fray, his movements swift and precise, his sword gleaming in flight. Orcs can't match his speed and agility. Every step he takes is a dance of death for his enemies. The young mage froze in amazement and admiration. That's what he is, a true warrior, he thinks as he sees Reed Rant fearlessly meet the onslaught of the enemy, standing firmly in the path of their destruction. The force of Reed Rant's blow crushes the enemies, their ranks crumbling like a wall under the hammer's blows. The echoes of his might spread across the battlefield, drawing admiration even among the orcs who had not expected such a confrontation. The young mage observes the scene, shocked. He was aiming for an orc mage? His eyes widened with surprise, seeing Raid Rant tearing through the enemy lines. The vice captain's blows are so great that even the orc mage's dark enchantments fly apart like flashes of light. He is ruthless and precise. His every move means victory. Wow, orcs cut like butter in the kitchen, 
the young mage can't help but notice as he observes Reed Rant's unprecedented agility. He realizes that before him is not just a warrior, but a true artist of battle, whose maneuvers blur the line between war and art. The Raid Rant bursts through the ranks of the enemy forces with unrelenting pressure. His powerful blow echoes BAM! And the orcs, like light pieces on a board, scatter under his onslaught. The young mage, amazed by this sight, cannot hide his admiration. Captain! He shouts, realizing the extent of the vice captain's power and bravery. Reed Rant's sweeps turn into a storm that sweeps away the orcs as if they were merely an obstacle in its path. Each of his movements is emphasized by an explosion of power, leaving behind only dust and destruction. No orc king is the equal of Captain Richard. Now that's power. The mage realizes with a twinkle in his eye that Reed Rant's skill level is far beyond his wildest assumptions. He is inspired and determined to follow his mentor's example and achieve the same greatness in battle. The young mage ponders Reed Rant's incredible skills, wondering if they were the same ones that Captain Richard once displayed. Perhaps the secret of their power lies not only in their weapons, but in their spirit, in their talent as warriors. He recognizes the defeat of the Orc King and realizes that a warrior's true strength is not in the sword, but in skill and experience. The mage's gaze on Reed Rant is full of admiration and genuine interest. On the way to the city, the mage marvels at how easily Raid Rant paves the way, shortening the distance between battle and peaceful life. His ability to go from war to peace is amazing. In response to the mage's request for help, Reed Rant, despite his seriousness in battle, shows kindness and willingness to help. As you wish, his simple and powerful endorsement speaks volumes. Thus, the mage and warrior continue their journey combining wisdom and strength, ready for new adventures and challenges. The mage and warrior continue on their way, reflecting on past events and conclusions reached. The young mage realizes the importance of strategy and discernment on the battlefield. Before the gates of the village, they ponder its future. If we leave things as they are, it's not out of the question that the village will be overrun by orcs, Reed Rant says, anticipating the possible consequences of their actions. He suggests that the mage spend the night at the camp, and then discuss the next steps. The rest will be handled by the Order of Knights, he concludes confidently as he ponders a plan of action to protect not only the village, but the entire area. Their conversation continues and they exchange information about the number of enemies. And how many were there? asks the magician. Fifty-two. And I don't think there's any more left, Reed Rant replies. The mage is amazed to realize that Reed Rant is not just a warrior, but a protector of all voices. Reed Rant shares the story of the village of Karina, where strange events began four years ago. He describes how the village began to supply more Alkiron, a magical stone full of mystery and power. The mage listens intently as Reed Rant continues to recount the aftermath of these events. The village was overrun by orcs, and monster carcasses with magic stones carved into them began to be found near the village. Reed Rant recalls how all of this led to him being taken into the service of the Granville Mansion and how lately all the Alkyron trees in the area have been cut, their stones stolen. The mage, remembering his recent exploits, how he not only hunted lions but also single-handedly destroyed monsters, feels proud of his accomplishments. Reed Rant recognizes his successes, and the mage feels that his acknowledgement is not only a word of thanks, but also an acknowledgement of his own skill and importance in the story. Priests and scholars thoughtfully studying the events have come to the conclusion that everything that has happened is true. However, they noted that the young mage had no talent based on their understanding of magical power and ability. The mage remembers the light filling the room when he touched the orb, but the question remains. Do they remember the events of the past when he first manifested his power? The symbols he saw are incomprehensible to the priests. Their inability to read them suggests that the magician's level of magical power is underestimated, and it carries something more than they may realize. Reed Rant turns to the mage and recognizes his true talent, which does not lie in the usual measures of magical power, but in his ability to fight and overcome obstacles. You have a talent, he says, emphasizing that true talent often hides behind everyday achievements and is awakened in moments of adversity. Mage and Reed Rant exchange a look. The mage notes with some concern that the problems are not completely resolved, but Reed Rant reassures him suggesting that they leave further conversations between them. Reed Rant then shares with the mage that the Baron noticed his talent long ago. This revelation comes as a surprise to the mage, who begins to understand why the Baron allowed him so much. The mage reflects that the Baron probably understood his passion for hunting and gave him the freedom to develop his skills. This realization gives him confidence in himself 
and his path. Reed Rant ends the conversation with an enigmatic smile, acknowledging that while the mage is interested in the details, he can't tell more. If the mage wants to know more, he can ask the Baron personally. This mystery only increases the magician's curiosity and desire to deepen his understanding of his own abilities.